So I, you know, I don't have, I don't have it out to the general audience. All right, we got a good level here. So hey, everybody. Um, Thanks for joining us. Uh, we got Dr. Robert Faust. He uh, is the owner of BioAg. He is a, um, a leading thinker in humic and fulvic acids. He's got a long history. Um, I'm sure he'll go into some of it. Um, but back in Hawaii and the biodynamic stuff, um, it's, it's been really good to know him over the last year. And so I'm not, I'm not going to talk anymore. We'll just go ahead for it. Dr. Faust, thank you. Hello. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. This is my inaugural webinar and uh, it's kind of a different approach, a little bit different information. And uh, <clears throat> my, my field of interest is agroecology and that has to do with studying ancient agricultural systems and see uh, what uh, was done historically in various crops, cropping systems, and how we can utilize that knowledge and then update it with modern uh, tools. So we don't always have to reinvent the wheel. In the case of hemp, that's got quite an interesting uh, history in agroecology. So I'm just gonna to touch on the high points because that could be a presentation in itself. So it's the history and relationship of cannabis to life on earth and human development, uh, how it was used and how it was managed. Now, it's nothing new, that's for sure. Uh, so, you go back into the United States, see, just like they're saying now, it's the new billion dollar crop. Wow! This is from Popular Mechanics Magazine in 1938. Of what a great potential it was, all the things you can do with it, it's really going to be a boom. Well, that kind of didn't happen. So, uh, it took 80 years to go from a new crop in 1938 with huge potential to a crime and then back to a new crop. But of course, cannabis is still a crime at the federal level. We've got to realize how many years, how much struggle it took to, to get where we are today. And here's a picture of the cover of The Emperor Wears No Clothes by Jack Herrera. Uh, signed and edited by Chris Conrad. These are some of the pioneers and that you can thank uh, these guys and people that were the pioneers to uh, get us to where we are today, to getting the truth out there. And <clears throat> agroecology aspects of it is it, it's pretty much in many areas of the world initially and, and today is grown as a wild plant. In other words, it, it, it established itself in large stands in valleys and in open places and just the whole range of, of locations uh, in areas where it was uh, adapted. And uh, we would just go out there and harvest as needed. There's still places and parts of India, Himalayas, uh, Bhutan, uh, lots of places uh, where it's wild and it's just harvested as a wild plant, either for uh, medicinal use, cannabis, spiritual use, or, or fiber. So you got to understand that the plant takes care of itself. That's the point. It grows, it maintains it, its conditions that are ideal to it. It actually builds its own soil. Uh, it's called ditch weed because we'll still find it. I've seen it growing in ditches before they had the big eradication efforts. Uh, it was a, an important food for overwintering migrating birds in the Midwest. <clears throat> so it was growing in fields, uh, growing in ditch banks, and uh, it was crucial to the whole environment. It fixed carbon. Uh, it produces its own humus, it helps conserve soil by preventing erosion, and it, and it fed migrating birds. Well, that's until they had the war on drugs, and most of the billions of dollars spent on eradication was actually on wild hemp in, in the U.S. You know, the only places where 
the eradication of green harvest really got, you know, cannabis, uh, commercial cannabis was pretty much California and Hawaii. And uh, the rest of the country spent billions of dollars to eradicate pitch weed. Uh, it was, was of no value except for the birds. And of course, the birds suffered uh, because their normal overwintering or migratory feed source was destroyed. And with our tax dollars, too, by the way. So that's kind of a tragedy that most people don't think about. But that's what happens. Uh, so I, I have to been in, in the uh, ground zero on the war of drugs when I lived in Hawaii, believe me. And uh, they, they spent a lot of money looking for, for cannabis hemp plants in the jungle of Hawaii. It was extreme, OK? So it has taken a long time to turn this back a little bit. But the plant is regenerative. It produces its own humus. It conserves soil and fixes carbon. It does that because as it grows towards the end of the season, it accumulates nutrients in the bottom leaves and salts too. The south of Texas helps to get salt. Uh, and then drops those big bottom leaves uh, towards the end of the season and then it starts dropping leaves. And uh, if it's not harvested, it continues to break down and, uh, and then it's converted uh, to humic substances by soil, fungi, bacteria. And that just goes on year after year and it builds up uh, a very high humus soil which it can then reestablish itself yearly by dropping seeds. So even if it was harvested, uh, there's always going to be seeds because uh, it produces a lot of seed. And in a layer of humus, uh, it will maintain that seed and then it will germinate in, a, in the warm, warmer days, early spring. If it hits the ground, it just hits mud, it might rot. So the, the plant is, is very successful in establishing its own conditions. We didn't have to help it traditionally. It's just, it's just there. Uh, in mainstream agricultural setting, the plant needs two things. Uh, it needs, uh, you know, humid, humid soil conditions. And uh, it doesn't like salt. So the, the use of so what we call salt fertilizers, or people refer to as chemical fertilizers, uh, are, are not ideal. Uh, it, it's not a salt loving plant. It, it produces humic substances by decomposition, and those humic substances protect it against salt uptake. And uh, so the idea of using salt, which is what kind of makes hydroponics a little iffy, I mean, it will grow in salts, which is what hydroponic media is, but it sure grows better when there's humic substances uh, added to the salt in a hydroponic system. In that case, it would be the fulvic acid, which is the acid soluble, and which would be normally available to the hemp plants in nature. And you have the, you want to generate the female energy, like uh, Jamaicans were telling me, no, you don't want to use chemical fertilizer. That uh, makes the plant mad, which means it, it, it induces a lot of uh, top growth and doesn't uh, produce as much uh, useful uh, flower or female energy. So I would say they, they make it mad. And uh, you could also say that it, it pretty much keeps it into the male energy. And, and sort of, uh, I would say, uh, delays the female energy or diminishes the female energy. So salt fertilizers, uh, not always a good uh, approach. Now, if we go back into ancient history, how, how long has cannabis been used? Well, we don't know, but it's actually in, uh, recorded in Egyptian documents on papyrus and hemp paper and in uh in, in temples you know on stone you know set in stone you might say so
So it goes back in the written literature, discusses the Egyptian god Seshat. And Seshat was the goddess who invented writing. She invented writing. Seshat in Egyptian means female scribe. Okay, so she is credited with inventing writing. Okay, so you can see the picture over here. She is wearing a leopard skin. She's in a hemp field. She's standing on buds and she's got a hookah over here and she's got a sort of a piece of rope. And the rope was used to measure measuring strength, which they used in their construction and doing all their elaborate construction. And then she's got a a tool here used to harvest the hemp. Now you see if her headdress on top of her head here is a cannabis leaf. And that's, uh, you'll see a lot of depictions of uh, set shot with this cannabis leaf uh, on her head, which is very interesting because it also has a symbolic reference to the female uh, sex organs, uh, which is what the dome uh, on top of that leaf represents. You can see right next to it what it actually represents. So going back in time, uh, cannabis was really associated with female energy and creation and destruction and writing. Uh, interesting. And then we get over to uh, uh, Indian uh, mythology and you have Kali Ma. Uh, consort of Shiva, <clears throat> and of course Shiva is associated uh, with uh, Kali and Shiva are associated with cannabis. And uh, Kali Ma was uh, a god of, of both uh, creation and destruction. Uh, it, it's a long story. Uh, I, I won't get into it. But, and then you get into uh, Chinese uh, and you have a uh, hemp goddess, a uh, Ma Gu. Ma means, in, 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 in Chinese, and apparently it, it may be related to the Kali Ma, but Ma means cannabis or hemp. And so Ma Gu who was like the hemp maiden. All right. So we have a very interesting uh, story of. of about the spiritual, uh, medicinal, and uh, and the use in fibers. So it's very very unique. Uh, in fact, the medical literature that dates back to four thousand years ago in Egypt. Uh, there's clearly uh, recommendations or methods of using cannabis medicinally for many many purposes and conditions. And I've, I've researched a lot of that. It's fascinating, uh, actually. So we're talking about something that is very, very ancient. May well be one of the first cultivated crops. The first people associated with the actual cultivation were the Chinese. Uh, and then hemp has been grown in the U.S. since colonial times. I come from an area of Pennsylvania, which is near Philadelphia, and they had the naval yard in Philadelphia, Philadelphia Naval Yard, where they made ship, built ships and equipped ships. And uh, the area around where I grew up in southeast Pennsylvania, uh, I had a lot of place names that were hemp, that had hemp in the place name, Hempstead, Hempfield, you know. So, they, Hemp was grown from a quick, a, a sailing ship. It was, it was an issue of national security. Interesting enough, the U.S. Navy still buys, still uses hemp rope, especially for towing barges, because if the hemp rope breaks, it doesn't snap back and uh, take your head off. It just drops straight down, so it, it, it does break. So the, uh, the specs on, on these ropes they use for towing barges yeah. And of course, the U.S. Navy obtained it from China. So 
we don't even produce our own hemp rope uh, for the Navy anymore. We live in China, which is kind of interesting. So uh, what, what I got here, the picture you're looking at is from a textbook called Principles of Field Crop Production by Mark and Leonard. It's a textbook that I had in college studying agronomy. Principles of Field Crop Production. It's a very old book and it has a whole chapter on growing hemp. So all the details are there, how it was done, fertility requirements, and how it's grown how it's grown for fiber. See on the left it's being grown for fiber. Uh, you're talking about a very thin stem, a very thick stand. Uh, and then the process that you're seeing there on the left is what they call do repping. Repping. It's an old English word that means rocking, repping. And so the hemp is cut and allowed to decompose. Uh, it's allowed to decompose to get rid of the, uh, the leaves and, and, uh, and some of the fiber, some of the uh, epidermis on the stalk. So right off the bat, you're looking at decomposition by fungal organisms. And if, if, if resin is not available, if you don't have dew, if you don't have enough moisture, it's not practical. Because that rotting or resin process is crucial. And that, in nature, of course, this is how it works in nature. It's starting to rot or decompose and forming, uh, releasing the nutrients and building up humus in the soil. So that's a natural part of, of hemp and hemp production. And I think it's part of the idea of Kali Ma, destruction, birth and death, creation and destruction. Um, and then on the right, you'll see a picture probably from the 20s, uh, maybe earlier, of the seed production side where you will, uh, the, the planting density is, 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 is not as dense. So you give, you give it more room. And on the left, of course, is, is a female plant, and on the right is a male plant. In ancient times, they pretty much wait for the the sexual expression, uh, and then they'd go in and first pull the male plants, utilize that first, and then uh, and then they might use that for fiber, and then they might weight it out on the females and use them for uh, spiritual and medicinal purposes and fiber. So, so the idea of agroecology, like they said, you know will investigate the crop from uh, the, the discovery of the crop to the domestication over centuries and use that knowledge to develop a program of modern hemp production. Centuries of hemp production have answers to the best modern methods to implement. Of organic and biogenetic methods are the best methods for this humus loving crop. It's not only a humus loving crop, it's a humus producing crop. And it's been that way forever, I mean, since the, the crop existed. So what, what we're talking about here, um, and, and, and there's emerging, uh, at least for my generation, of, uh, of organics and hemp production, or cannabis production, or marijuana production. Uh, most of the growers back in the day clandestine growers, like in Hawaii or wherever, uh, Oregon, Oregon, Washington, wherever it was, uh, were, were pretty much organic farmers, and they were using organic inputs. They were uh, not only pioneers in, in, in growing uh, cannabis, but they were also pioneers for organic farming. Somehow, you know, those things merge. The people that were the pioneers, the early adapters, counterculturists, I will say, uh, were, were also uh, staunch believers in, uh, in, in the environment, and using organic techniques, as well as producing cannabis. And a lot of people uh, learned about organic farming through cannabis. And a lot of the suppliers 
we're selling the same stuff, you know, 50, 60 years ago that we, that we use today in organic, in organic farming. So bottom line, we need to understand these methods. We don't have to reinvent the wheel, that's for sure. That wheel has been invented and it's, it's uh, we just have to understand. So, so why are biostimulants important today? It's because we do it differently today. You know, people are planting fields, you know, they're using planters, modern equipment, or they're cloning, you know, an old greenhouse, you know, they're planting in a field or they're planting in greenhouses, they're planting. So it's not, it's not the favorite condition for a hemp plant. The favorite condition for a hemp plant is it, it's growing in pure sand by itself without anybody's help. And it's regrowing uh, every year on its own. And, uh, and, uh, the, the uh, what we're trying to do is, is we're changing the conditions and we're forcing it to grow in just a, a, a raw mineral soil. And there, there are better ways of doing that. And bottom line is human substances. Now you can test the soil for human substances. You can test the soil for microbial uh, balance, distribution of microbes, fungus, bacteria and so on and so forth. Uh, now we find that, that there are substances that have been traditionally used. And uh, human substances have been definitely traditionally used. Uh, they were probably using compost, compost of manure, uh, manure for sure, I know that. Uh, and they were using uh, later on in history in this country, using kelp-based cytokinins, like good old maxi crop kelp from Norway was a, was a standby product in both cannabis and organic production. And nowadays we're using more specific microorganisms, particularly mycorrhizal fungi, because hemp is a mycorrhizal plant and uh, it's crucial to, to hemp uh, that it has a shallow, a very broad root system. Um, and it can actually pick up nutrients from the surface. But I was telling somebody that the other day, they didn't understand that. Yes, you can top dress uh, hemp because it actively feeds from the surface, if given the right conditions. And those right conditions are uh, first a layer of compost and then a layer of uh, lesser compost organic material. So what we're trying to do there is duplicate nature where we have a highly decomposed compost. And then under that is where you have humus formation in the soil, where you have an interface between the mineral soil and the, and the dust layer or the, the organic layers. And then you have a, a younger organic layer on top, which would be uh, leaves, branches, stuff like that. It's not as decomposed. So we're looking at a three layer situation. And that's ideal for you, where you have a <clears throat> gradient issue down to the soil surface and below. Okay, and then trace elements are crucial because you have so much chemistry. So many cannabinoids and other substances are produced by this plant. It needs trace elements and specific balance, which it creates itself. If, if it has established stands, uh, wild stands for years and years, it will tend to balance the soil out. Of course, human substances balance the soil, balance the pH more to uh, neutral or slightly acid. Uh, it can, it's a, uh, a type of substance that can, uh, that can balance pH from, from a high pH to, uh, to more to a neutral or from, from an alkaline to more to an MSC. So it's an amphoteric substance. So, so the, the yield potential is tremendous. I, I, I think I may have some pictures. I think a lot of people have seen some of the pictures of, 
of plants that are given op really optimum conditions and pruned. And, and uh, we have some of our uh, customers that, that are getting as much as four pounds for a plant. You know, I mean, that, that's kind of unusual, but uh, it can be done. And it's, it's what, what I'm getting at, whether that's practical or not. But the point is, it has a high genetic potential, uh, much higher than we uh, most people ever see. <clears throat> so nowadays, since we're not allowing hemp to grow its natural way, which is doing its own thing, and, and we just we're just gathering, uh, uh, we have to look we have to look at this a little bit differently, and and use utilize modern tools to try to really duplicate the nutritional and the other factors uh, involved, you know, in natural hemp uh, growth. So biostimulants is just a fancy word for what we used to call organic fertilizers. You know, I'm back to the kelp, the humus, the, uh, the bat, bat manure, manure, you know, for instance, I've told this story before, uh, about tra traditional growers in Jamaica. Uh, Jamaica, uh, where did they get, where did that come from? Where did it come from? Uh, ganja. Where did that come from? Well, it came from India, uh, Indian indentured servants that were brought to Jamaica after the times of, time of slavery. And they brought the ganja seeds. And they brought the tradition around ganja, or marijuana, uh, with them. Uh, and, uh, and it caught on, obviously. <laughs> and Jamaica became a cannabis culture. And so if you ask a Jamaican about fertilizer, of course, like I said, he will say, well, it makes the plant mad, which means it goes to the top row. And that's, that's not what they're looking for, <laughs> you know. Uh, so they will use their favorite approach. This is, this is a good piece of agroecology. Uh, the, the, the term, now things have changed a little bit in Jamaica. I was there last winter, and it's not the same as it was. But they uh, would, would say, you know, well, you've got any good stuff, and they'll say, well, I got goat shit. I got goat shit. Now, goat shit is, is a term for the best quality ganja. Okay. So they knew, you know, from experience, uh, that if they used goat manure or compost from goats, they got the best results. That's because goat and sheep manure has the best balance. Uh, chicken manure, no, 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 guys. That's got way too high of a phosphate level. It's not an even balance between nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash and trace elements. Uh, sheep and goat is. So that tends to become a standard approach. Also, the use of, uh, of what they call rat pack, rat pack shit, which to us is, is bat guano. Bat guano is highly favored uh, as an organic fertilizer. And of course, we know from modern science that the highest THC levels are really the only limiting factor, I would say, the only thing you can correlate with a high THC is phosphate. So the phosphate levels have to be there. And, but not just that. Let's just not get carried away and put some monoammonium phosphate down. Uh, so that guano. It is a good source of, of phosphate and lots of other stuff too. So we can stay and not get carried away. So if you look at what I consider, uh, in my experience, and of course I, I've sampled the cannabis around the world, different locations, um, that I always always go back to Jamaica. They, they seem to have the best quality, uh, not, not just. Uh, uh, not just cannabis or ganja, they also have the best coffee and, and, and well, even mushrooms. But anyway, uh, they do have uh, some of the best 
of ganja in the world. And I think that started with the folks that brought the seed over. Undoubtedly, they had hand-selected seed from India over a thousand and uh, brought those seeds with them. So the, the genetics were very, very good uh, right off the bat. And then over the years, uh, the growing conditions there are ideal uh, for just about anything. So it, it, it's really favorable. And then uh, culture developed. And, and I'm talking about like well, what, what's really the genetic potential of, of ganja or, or cannabis? Well, if you go to the grill, which is the, the west end of the island of Jamaica, they, they'll take you for a ride of horses through the ganja field. Okay, so you're sitting on a horse, not a pony, you're sitting on a horse, and the tops of the, of the plants are towering above you, and you're sitting on a horse. So uh, the uh, genetic potential is, is great. And, and, and the production techniques are strictly organic. I mean, I, I don't make I'm sure you know there's people that aren't doing organic, but traditionally, it, it's an organic approach, and pretty much the fields remain the fields. I mean, they're they're not uh, they're they're, they're going to be the ganja fields every year. So why do we use? Well, we don't have those conditions. Uh, and we don't have the ideal conditions like that. So we're doing it differently. People are cloning, they're planting in fields, they're planting in hoop houses, uh, they're planting in greenhouses. Uh, there's lots of outside production, what they call sun-grown, which always seems ironic to me. You know, with the, the, the appearance of the sun-grown. Yeah, you know, I... Oh, well, that's a new, that's a new one, it's sun grown. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and a lot of people, that, here's another one, I'm just, I'm just going to rant a little bit on this, on some of these subjects. Uh, one is that, you know, that people think they need extensive greenhouse of climate control conditions. Uh, they treat, they treat it like, uh, like something that's so sensitive to everything that you have to, you know, filter the air, it, it has to protect it like a baby and all that stuff. <laughs> well, the only reason that was done, I mean, grow life, inside growing, growing in basements, growing in lava tubes in Hawaii, uh, the only reason that was done is because it's a clandestine crop. I mean, it's the idea of hiding it. Uh, the grow life, are, you're trying to duplicate the sun with uh, electrical energy. Uh, it's not, a, it, it's absolutely not a requirement for, to, to grow hemp or ganja or cannabis, it, 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 you know, in those conditions. That's strictly because it was illegal. And, and, and I think that a lot of people, love, I guess they don't understand that. I don't know. But uh, now all of a sudden you have a sun-grown growers guild in Oregon. And you have a magazine, sun, gr sun grown, you know, and all this. Like, this is a new thing, a new revelation. You, you, you can grow it in the sun. Um, it, just, it just blows my mind. I mean, why would you spend millions and dollars, millions and millions of dollars to set up these inside growers? I mean, I, I frankly prefer the outside sun grown, to tell you the truth. I, I, as far as, I mean, of course, I've grown in every conceivable way. Aeroponics, hydroponics, you know, LEDs, uh, sodium vapor, every kind of light, uh, outside, every kind of way, uh, in the jungle, <laughs> wherever, you know. Uh, the best results I get in Oregon are, you know, just using simple plastic hoop houses and then just growing in the soil. The soil that uh, you know, we we prepare. You know, we'll, we'll dig a hole. Or oh, add the traditional inputs. Uh, could be you know bat guano. Could be well compost. Uh, compost and sheep. Raised sheep. And there is a reason for that. And uh, of, of things, you know, materials. And then you put your compost, your layer compost. And then you plant your plant or your seed. 
and then you put a layer of mulch on top of that. And then you set up your uh, micro sprinklers. And you keep a constant, but not too wet, not too dry moisture condition. And that way you're actually trying to uh, imitate natural uh, conditions. In fact, growing that way, we, we you know, we, we actually get uh, volunteer plants that that, um, that that grow from seed, drop seed, a little bit of drop seed, and you start getting some uh, volunteers, you know, very, very early in, in the spring in a hoop house. And we got to the point where we just let them grow. And, and so actually duplicating the, the original cannabis production, which was self-sustaining. Uh, but when we're using, you know, large scale production today, which I call the industrial model, uh, we're, we're going to be using biostimulants to get the best results. And, and that's what people do. I mean, that's, that's the real world because I know they, they buy a lot of them from us. Um, so what they're really doing is they're improving the efficiency of the plant's metab metabolism to induce yield increases and enhance crop quality, increasing plant tolerance to and recovery from abiotic stress. Uh, you know, but bottom line, these plants grew by themselves for years, you know, and they, 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 they had tolerance to stress, all kinds of stresses. It's because they produced these substances over time, over centuries themselves with the help of microorganisms in the soil. And, uh, but nowadays we're, we're using the bio uh, fertilizers, or we'll say organic fertilizers, facilitating nutrient assimilation, translocation, and use. So things like kelp, humic substances, humic acid, folic acid, uh, amino acids, uh, will facilitate uh, nutrient assimilation, even though they don't provide nutrients themselves. We're back to the difference between a mineral supplement or minerals, which are required by plants, and organics. And what is organic? Carbon. It's species of carbon, not just carbon like ground up coal or ground up charcoal briquettes or so called biochar. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about species of carbon. And that would be <coughs> things that that are converted or become uh, things like vitamins and amino acids and a whole range of things that are actually carbon compounds, uh, plant growth stimulants, hormones, toxins, etc. And then things that stimulate root growth. Okay, mineral fertilizers don't stimulate root growth. It's species of carbon, it's organic substance. As a matter of fact, Specifically, folic acid, so called folic acid, uh, is, is specific for stimulating root growth, root hair development, and all that. So, if you have more root development, more root hair development, you, you have better water use, you have better nutrient uptake, you have better um, survival uh, in stress conditions if you have, if you're anchored by a, a better root system. Or winds. Torrential rains, lots, lots of, of effects that the plant has to survive. And so we are enhancing soil fertility also by fostering the development of complementary soil microorganisms. And so when we're growing the plant, we've got to realize that plants are symbiotic within the environment and the soil environment, and they have symbiosis with, with a whole range of microbes. So when we're growing a crop, we have to consider the microbes. We're also growing microbes. But what kind? That, that, that's crucial. Okay. So biostimulants are different from standard crop inputs. Uh, this, this is more aimed at, you know, your conventional farmers that are, for the last uh, 100 years, maybe less, you use salt fertilizers, what we call salt fertilizers. So oh, that's be like ammonium nitrate and potassium phosphate. Uh, these are all the same compounds that are used in hydroponic <coughs> too. So we call those mineral or 
mineral salts, really, in other words, because they're soluble salts. Uh, <clears throat> you know, when, when, you, when you combine ammonium, which is an alkaline, uh, with, to, with phosphoric acid, and, and you allow them to react and neutralize, then you have a ammonium phosphate. So that's what salt fertilizers is. And most agriculture is using salt fertilizers. And most of the, a lot of the products you see in grocery shops uh, are really camouflaged uh, salt fertilizers, where they're using uh, <clears throat> these these chemical salts and then adding some other stuff, maybe humic acid, maybe amino acids, maybe kelp, things like that. But uh, plants do need the minerals, all right. But the minerals are released from decomposition of the organic matter that the plants took up the year before and fell down and will decompose and they can be taken up again by the crop. So, and they differ from crop protection products too. Crop protection products are like pesticides. They kill stuff. Okay. Uh, biostimulants also have an effect on the plant's bigger and they don't have any direct action on against pests or diseases, but they actually stimulate uh, pathways, genetic pathways, that turns on the plant and the plant cell, plant cell, or the plant, has defenses that can be switched on and it produces its own uh, uh material to help it resist, resist pathogens and disease. So that you don't need poisons to do that. You just need to give the plant and the, and the, and the soil microbes what they need. And so we, we talk about, you know, what are biostimulants? Uh, like I say, it used to be just for what we call organic fertilizers, but technically they're not fertilizers. Uh, the, the, on the new farm bill, they're coming out with a new category called biostimulants. So these products are being recognized uh, as, as another category, and then they'll be registered uh, on a federal level as biostimulants. And so biostimulants do not contain NPK as the primary uh, which, which are also called plant food. That's another thing I have a problem with. <laughs> so they call salt fertilizers plant foods. We need to feed our plants. No, no, no. Uh, CO2 is plant food. Uh, CO2 is produced from that decomposition in the, uh, uh, down in the soil, down in the soil surface. Uh, uh, decomposition of organic matter and it's taken up by the plant. That's plant food. The plant releases oxygen as a byproduct. And the last that I checked, we need oxygen on the planet Earth. And, uh, so you have different categories here of biostimulants. You have humic acid. And humic acids are, are nothing more than the end product of decomposition uh, of organic matter. Uh, it's a very, very broad term. Uh, it, it, it's dependent, the quality of the humic acids depend on what was decomposed, what plant products or remains or whatever. You know, it turns out that, that the, your, uh, uh, the, the humic acids with the real biological activity are derived from a broadleaf trees, leaves, bark, wood, uh, especially broadleaf, which would be like oak, beech, birch. Um, not, not so much your uh, evergreen, uh, like your pine, fir, all that stuff. It doesn't really produce a good grade of humic acid. Uh, and then you have your seaweed extract. Oh, you use the vitamins, really, and uh, pretty, pretty reliable. Uh, extracted from a uh, large kelp, which, of course, kelp doesn't have roots, so it absorbs like nutrients from the ocean. And it produces a range of uh, well, the reason why it works. I mean, it does have a good uh, it does have a good balance of, of, of trace elements, micronutrients, 
uh, but it's particularly high in cytokines, which are growth stimulants or growth regulators. That all plants produce, it's just that kelp produces more. So when you make an extract, kelp, create other plants, they get the benefits. And uh, <clears throat> so what we used to say, and what I, I learned from old uh, Dr. Sen at uh, Clemson University, who was one of the first scientists that published on kelp extracts and, and tried to figure out uh, why they work, how they work. And so he came up with, with the, you know, the proof that it was cytokinins, which are like plant hormones, that are that are doing it. And he always used to explain it to farmers that it makes the flower sexy. See? And we would also say it's the female energy. So, you know, we have a product called Cytoplus, and it contains astrophilonodosum. Uh, and we spray that on it uh, at the uh, initiation of, of flower, uh, the development of uh, of differentiation into female uh, energy because it, 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 it shifts the energy to the female, makes the flower sexy. So you can get better pollination and uh, and female energy. Remember the goddesses? Female goddesses, okay? Female energy. All right, well, that's where kelp comes in. Um, so that's used to shift to solid, solid shift the female energy. We're done with the male energy. The male energy is stimulated by salt fertilizers. It makes the plant mad. Remember that? Okay. <laughs> and and then, then you go, let's go through the list here. You got protein. Uh, these are things made from uh, soy uh, alfalfa. Uh, not use that that much, but you know there, there's a lot of potential there. And glycine, bacine, that's that's derived from um, uh, soybeans. So you can have your your uh, amino acids. Okay, but more importantly, we're over here to plant growth promoting rise of bacteria. So you have a whole range of bacteria that produce also produce hormones. They produce substances that protect the root system. Uh, and you have like azospirillium. There's a whole range, you know, of stuff. And I, I think the most important is uh, uh, the mycorrhizal fungi because that, that's really a feature of, of wild stands and, and wild plants. And it's much more stable, you know, it produces stable spores that overwinter and then regerminate in the spring when the root systems are developed. It's more in line with 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 the plant cycle, and uh, so the mycorrhizal fungi are bacteria. They're fungi, and they are directly symbiotic. In other words, they live in the root. They attach themselves to the root, and they feed off of excess sugars. Uh, carbohydrates produced by the plant, and then they in turn uh, produce uh, stimu growth stimulants and enzymes and substances to help release phosphate to the plant. And uh, so it's pretty reliable. You can check the root system if you have them or you don't. You can tell. The bacteria, you can't really tell. You don't know what's going on with bacteria. But with uh, mycorrhizal fungi, you can do a, a dye stain, look under the microscope, you, you can send it to a lab, you can determine, you know, what percentage mycorrhizal uh, <clears throat> activity you have. It's reliable, you know, mycorrhizal products uh, have a long shelf life. Um, they're pretty different. I mean, we just had a situation here in Oregon where I always get the numbers wrong, so don't, don't hold me to the numbers, but there's something like 50 plants uh, or so uh, that were registered in the state of Oregon that have microbial stuff, you know, things that are supposedly have bacteria or mycorrhizal. So out of, out of something like 50, uh, two or three passed, all the rest had stop sale notices because they couldn't 
um, they couldn't meet the legal claims when these products were actually tested. Uh, well, I will say we're one of the two that did pass, by the way, uh, <clears throat> with our mycorrhizal product. Uh, it's not that I'm against bacterial products. I've sold bacterial products. I believe in bacterial products. It's just, I don't want to get a stop sale notice because the, a lot of these bacterial products are unstable. Uh, and, uh, and it's kind of, you wonder whether they're really working. Whereas we can monitor mycorrhizal. We, we know it's stable. We know we got, you know, we can count it. We can count the spores. We can put that on the label and it's going to be, it's going to be there. Uh, and so that's, that's the advantage of mycorrhizal fungi over bacterial cultures. And, and I kind of believe that a lot of the bacterial products out there have nothing to do with bacteria. It has to do with the, the substances created in the media while you're producing the bacteria. And so you may have a dead product, but it has uh, uh, biochemicals you know, in the media that stimulate fungi and other stuff in the soil. And, and, and root growth and all that, you know, kind of like your kelp. So that, that's, that's the important ones there, I would say, are, are human gas, seaweed extract, and then your plant growth promoting uh, uh, organisms in the root system. And, and, well, and of course, why would you use these? Well, uh, seaweed, you know, you've got to transport nutrients from the root. The human substance is the, you know, the growth of root, root biomass, and uh, in a whole range of, of interacting benefits that end up with, you know, like it says down here, economic and environmental benefit, higher crop yield savings of fertilizers, and reduced losses to the environment. Okay, that's that's true. Of all these, higher crop yield under stress conditions, high salinity. Higher crop yield under stress conditions, enhanced nutritional value, biofortification of plant tissues, and then humic substances. You have higher crop yield savings, fertilizer, and reduces loss, reduced losses to the environment. So, you know, in, in these categories, these five different things, they have overlapping effects and benefits. That's why I say you don't have to use all of them. You know, if you use humic acids and kelp, and the uh, and rises bacteria like like uh, mycorrhizal fungi, you're good, okay. Um, so, you know, I, I can go into a lot of the details on this. I, I'm not sure that's where we want to go, but just to talk about the, the effect of kelp extracts, it's applied as a foliar, generally applied as a foliar, but it definitely can be applied as a soil. Uh, a top dress application, uh, very, very, very effective uh, on that level too. And it'll be uptake by the root system or, or, or the leaves. It's just you get a quicker result in the leaf. You're not uh, feeding the microbes, you're feeding directly the, the plant itself. And you get, you know, you can see what you get here. You get uh, proof shoot root growth, higher flowering. There, there you go, there's the female energy. Higher flowering and fruit set than are yield. And then, of course, you get into the science of it here. You have modulation of phytohormones, increased photosynthesis, and so that the plant can use carbon dioxide and produce uh, plant tissue and you know, everything that the plant needs. And then carbon assimilation. So that's why we see a synergistic effect between kelp and humic acid. When they're used together, the results are better than either one of them used individually. Because the, the kelp will help uh, photosynthesis as well as carbon assimilation. So the carbon is coming from the humic substance and the humus. Uh, and again, the, uh, you have the stress resistance, resistance to fungal, bacterial, and viral pathogens. I mean, we used to know back in the day that kelp would reduce uh, or eliminate uh, infestations of mites 
So there's some relationship between kelp, eating the kelp extract and mite infestation. No, it's not a control of mites, but it helps uh, the plant resist the mites. And I think mites are almost a genetic disease. They're almost uh, related to nutrient, uh, uh, like almost like a nutrient deficiency, almost like a disease. And then you have the antimicrobial anti-feed, so it turns the plant, the insect off to the plant. You know, they don't like it for some reason. And then your drought and salt tolerance and freezing and chilling and antsy photosynthesis, uh, nutrient uptake, all kinds of good things, you know. Um, so kelp's kind of an important thing, it's kind of inexpensive kind of effective, more is better with these things. These things are used at homeopathic rates. Uh, using more can actually cause a negative effect. Keep that in mind, stick to the label. Uh, and like I say, it provides mite resistance and there's data there in the scientific literature. Uh, aphids, for instance, are generally avoid plants treated with seaweed extracts. This is, this is extra from scientific literature like Stevens in 1966. Uh, poached trees are just red spider mite populations, things like that. Uh, seaweed extract application resulted in level of control similar to that of a paroxide, which are chemicals that kill mite. Uh, the use of maxi cop on stirred strawberry plants greatly reduced the use of red spider mite populations. See, so all those good things happen. And of course, if in cannabis, not just cannabis, uh, a, lot, a lot of things, mites are the biggest problem. Um, and, and I could go into that in, in deep, deep ways. Because I've done a lot of work with mite, mite control. And uh, I can kind of tell you that there is a natural occurring fungus out there that's in the environment that controls mites. And uh, so when you're growing a greenhouse or you use fungicide or you say you're growing strawberries in an uh, industrial model, you're using a lot of fungicide, actually protecting the mite population against neozygetes, which is a, a very specific fungi that kills mites. It's a parasite. It controls them and you, you can, you can uh, determine which mites actually were infected and actually we used to have a technique where you take insects and you mash them up, put them in a sprayer, mites and insects and stuff, and spray them back on the plant. And you get results, you get control. And nobody ever knew why that was. Well, they didn't know about, uh, they really didn't know about biopesticides or news I need. Uh, I've done this experimentally where I took infected mites, uh, which are actually fairly easy to determine under a microscope and put them in, in water and, and some wetting agent and spray them on a, on a strawberry crop and get 80% control of mites. It's because I'm, I'm actually uh, using a, a, a disease. It's actually more considered a parasite than a disease. And, and But in nature, you'll get it. Like if you grow outside, you won't have so many mite problems. You go to these substances and these fungi uh, and the natural enemies are there, but in the greenhouse, different story. Uh, and like I said, y'all from human gas that are synergistic, they work together. <clears throat> they really work together. And yeah, human gas and see would actually have root mass enhanced by 21 to 68 uh, percent. You know, and then you're talking about here's some of the chemistry, geotin riboside and cytokines, I won't get into all of that. Um, yeah, so that's, you see some of these slides I use when I give present presentations to scientists, or like the American Society of Agronomy or something like that. So it's, it's a little more academic, some of it. So <clears throat> not particularly interesting. And then, uh, so our, our solution to this is Cyber Plus, which is a combination of uh, Norwegian kelp extract powder, soluble powder, 
and uh, a uh, activated uh, humic substance, which is soluble, and then trace elements at specific uh, concentrations and ratios that aid the enzyme uh, activation, or, or they're actually uh, components in enzymes, these specific trace elements. And some of them, like iron, cobalt, and molybdenum, are crucial for the, for the microbes and the fungi and the soil. So that, that's what the Cyto Plus is. And we use that at the uh, time of uh, sexual differentiation. But you can use it any time. Uh, and, and so why do we do giant pumps? It's just a, it's really interesting. I mean, they have uh, here on the West Coast and Oregon, particularly California, competition to grow giant pumpkins. Well, you learn a lot by doing this because you're pushing the envelope. You're, you're, you're trying to, they're, they're doing plant breeding too, so they're, they're pushing the genetics uh, and they're pushing the nutritional. And, and it's, the bottom line is, is getting to the optimum, getting to the, uh, to the, uh, <clears throat> reach the genetic potential uh, of, a, of a particular crop, and that's way higher than what, what, what we're normally looking at. Uh, this, this is work I did with, with a Native American woman who we helped over the years uh, using uh, our products, our biostimulants, to, to increase uh, these uh, the pumpkins. Of course, this is 2011. By now, I mean, in the last year or so, we're up over a ton weight on these pumpkins. Uh, and I've never seen anything, you know, in so few years we, we get to such levels. Uh, and it's, 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 I'm interested in it because it's about finding crop limiting factors and uh, dealing with those crop limiting factors. You take, get to the next yield plateau. So if we're going to feed the world, at the present population growth, we're going to have to have as much land as the country of Brazil within the next 30 or 40 years. Okay, that's not going to happen. You know, there isn't that much land. So we better be looking at getting the genetic potential out of crops. So that's why we do this kind of work. And then we get back to humic substances, which is something that, that I've worked with for probably about 50 years. We didn't understand how they work. Uh, we knew they worked from observation. And, but the status quo of science at the time, the land grant colleges like the one I went to, never mentioned human substances. I mean, they never gave it any credibility. And they really sort of don't even now, you know, unless you pay them, unless you get the grant money to study it, because it doesn't fit. You know, the industrial model, the petrochemical based uh, program. Okay, so uh, this goes back when I was uh, kind of, uh, I won't say survivalist, that wasn't the word. Then it was like back to nature, you know, the back to nature kind of guy, right? And so I was up in northwest Montana, and we were really back to nature type guys. I mean, that was, you know, Having an organic garden, cutting your own firewood, hunting and fishing, the real deal, right? And uh, I had some pretty poor soil, and I was uh, wondering something about it. And I just happened to see a little classified ad in Montana Farmer's Stock. And I, the company sent me a little sample, a little sample of some dusty, dirt looking stuff. And this is a picture from 1973. So I took soil from my land, which is highly overgrazed, compacted. It's really, really unproductive. We wouldn't grow six inch tall grass. I mean, that wouldn't be good. Grew we six inch tall grass and more like two inches. Really bad. And so I took that soil and I just put a little pinch of this, whatever it was, they called it clod buster, uh, humane. I had no idea what it was. And, 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 you, know, and I, you know, I went to an ag school too. <laughs> I, 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 didn't know any, I didn't know anything at the time. Okay. So I just put it on the soil and planted corn, sweet corn, and this is the result. Oh my God. Like, oh my God. Like, that stuff works. What is it? 
They didn't know what it was. And neither did the guy I got it from. I mean, they, they, it was Colonel Leland Taylor. I should give him some uh, credit because he, he, he was a retired Air Force colonel. And he somehow got involved in this mine and promoting uh, humans. And uh, he's been uh, maligned over the years. But he was a pioneer. Of course, pioneers end up with the arrows in their back. So this, this is what got me started. You can see my little uh, a geodesic dome greenhouse I built from a Buckmeister Fuller design. See, so uh, you know, we were into it, so we made it. Uh, I had a geodesic dome. Right. And then, uh, of course, I was, uh, my interest in my training was in uh, biological control, you know, pest management, called pest management. I was a believer, you know, in natural uh, biological controls. That was my big interest. That's what I studied at the University of Delaware. And I was committed. I don't know why. I don't know how that happened, but that's how it happened. So, I worked with uh, seed potato growers and different type of farmers in, in uh, Montana and other areas. And so, based on the results I got with the little humid sample, I, uh, <clears throat> we, we, we bought a, a truck and uh, at the time it was only about 20 bucks a ton. You know, the freight was higher. And so, it was no great stuff to it. So we put, it was a 40 acre field and we, we put half of it with the Humane product and then the other half we just left. So on the left here was the treated side that was using 250 pounds an acre. And then you can see right to the row, I mean, this is the untreated side. Uh, I didn't even close the rows, you know, so it was, it lacked the vigor. Yeah, it was obvious. And, uh, well, I'll go back to that again. Uh, the treated, uh, uh, the untreated, had lots of insect feeding damage. The leaves almost looked like Swiss cheese. There was that much insect damage. The treated didn't have any, hardly any feeding damage. So I'm a young idealistic entomologist trying to like, change the world, eliminate pesticides, blah, blah, blah. I came from the chemical capital of the world, Bloomington, Delaware, home to DuPont, Syngenta, you know, Dow, all those. So I was uh, sort of alternative to that. And I, th I think cannabis may have some effect on, on my thinking. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, what I saw in this experiment was a mirror. Uh, this dirt, whatever it was, it's human. Uh, protected these potatoes against insect damage and feeding right to the row. Like, what? You know, and, and of course that wasn't even mentioned by the promoters of human as, as something that happened. And so uh, that put me on the road uh, to, to why is that? But of course the University of Montana and everybody else would say, no, this stuff doesn't work, snake oil, blah, blah, blah. Well, you can see it wasn't. This is, uh, Second growth alfalfa with and without. So this top dressing. And yeah, here's with, here's without on the bottom of the slide here. So fat, rapid regrowth of a legume, um, in, in much vigorous, much higher yield, uh, you know, on, on alfalfa. Uh, so over the years, I started looking into the literature. Turns out that humate is seen to be the most researched plant biostimulant in the world, but no one had all the answers. And it wasn't called biostimulant either. You know, they didn't know what to call it. They call it a um, soil condition. You know, call it snake oil. You know, call it that looks like dirt. I've heard it all, believe me. But I stuck with it because I knew it worked. I knew something was happening. But I also found out from experimenting with other so-called human products that they all don't work. That added another level of complexity. How come they all don't work? So I reviewed the world literature and over the years, and I went to different seminars like Northeast University Human Acid Research Group in Boston and then Cars Five. And once the internet came in, I was really, you know, wow. 
So then I was corresponding with Russian and Chinese researchers, and, and, and so I was pulling it all together, different countries, different research, different information. And then my own testing, uh, from around the world, okay? And we did find out this huge variation. But what, what is the index? I mean, you can produce your own. I mean, I think you jump back into the biodynamics, which, which I kind of like to do if I have time, but biodynamics is where this sort of came from. Uh, it goes back, I can go through the whole story. Gert, uh, Steiner, and, uh, you know, Rodale and all that. But biodynamics was considered some kind of woo-woo thing. No, that can't work, blah, blah, blah. It's the same story, right? They just science had caught up with it. And so, like, if I pulled out a cell phone today, or 100 years ago, let's say, or let's say 200 years ago, 100 years ago, that's good. So if I pulled out a cell phone 100 years ago, I might be burned at the stake or, or lynched or something, because it's magic. It's like some kind of a demon in, in there or something. Well, that, that's how things go. You know, and I think biodynamics had a lot of the answers, uh, you know, way before its time, you know, but, but yet they didn't exactly know what the mechanisms were, but observation kind of showed it could work. We don't know what they're doing, okay. So what they're really doing was producing a uh, human substance, and, and, and that's the idea of biodynamic compost. And it takes time, so it's not just a short-term compost and you're done. You know, it's a, it had to be cured, it had to smell right, it had to have critters running around in it. So mature, or what they call well-rotted compost, aged compost, whatever. That's because of the molecular weights involved of humans. Humans, humans goes into different, uh, you have different humic substances. You have humic, fulvic, fulvic. And, and what they really are is just diff different uh, uh, degrees of decomposition. With the, the fulvic meaning the, the final endpoint where you can't decompose it anymore. Okay, so that contains, you know, and, and I really want to get this point across that there's no chemical called humic acid or fulvic acid. It's, it's a broad group. These are just mean fractions. They just mean fractions. Uh, humic acid is, 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 is black, dark, fulvic acid is brown, yellow, dull. Olmic acid is sort of blackish brown, gray. And human is something that's uh, residual and not soluble. It's, this is actually considered the most complex chemistry on Earth. So, you know, let's get that established. Okay, so with modern science using things like nuclear magnetic resonance, we can break out humic substances into their large groups. And that's what we call functional groups. So you have class A functional group groups, that's your ketones, your carbonyls, your, your quinones, carbonyls, carboxyls, that's is carbohydrate. Uh, and then you have, you know, class A, B, C, D. The pro uh, aromatic protein carbon, and then class E, methyl and methylene. Now, methyl and methylene are sulfur containing. Now, okay, this is complicated. I'm, I'm not going to get too far into this, but some of these functional groups are positive to plant growth, and some of them are negative. Like your methyl and methylene groups, that's associated with coal, oil, you know, petrochemicals. They're negative to plant growth. So some humates are closer to coal, and they have a higher level of methyl and methylene groups. It can actually cause a uh, reduction of plant growth. Okay, so there's tremendous variation between so-called humates, humates and compost, for that matter. There's huge, huge differences. But we found that the carboxyls and the phenols you know, uh, polyphenols, you know, that's what's in like grape skin, it's good stuff, it's good for you, antioxidant, and all that. So, these functional groups uh, are just broad categories. It's like human substances, fully human, are broad. And so, 
within these classes of, uh, of functional groups, uh, these are the precursors for specific compounds within these other groups, like flavonoids, like uh, polyphenols, tannins, vitamins, coenzyme Q10, vitamin K. These are all precursors to this stuff. Chlorophyll, free amino acids, uh, fatty acids. Then you get into uh, things like uh, amino acids, tyrosine. And tyrosine is uh, amino acid that's found in humic substances. And we have associated that with why when humic acids are applied to a lot of soils, you see more earthworm activity. It's because tyrosine is a limiting factor to earthworm development. So these, these amino acids are, are important components. There's tryptophan, the whole range of lysine there. Uh, and of course, these affect the cannabinoid profile. See, these are precursors to the next level of biochemistry that happens in the plant itself, where these substances are necessary. Okay, so within these substances, some of these substances are responsible for gene expression. In other words, it's what turns on the plant's defenses against disease and insects, or turns on uh, plant growth regulator uh, expression within the plant itself. You know, so that is in the group of, of polyphenols and tannins. And that's why I say that the best effects Fuming substances are ones that contain hardwood leaves, oak. Well, depending on what the decomposed organic matter was, it, it is how this is all going to come out in these functional groups and, and, and the, the components, which are really carbon. Okay, so we're back to carbon, and all the things on this chart on the right are species of carbon. They're carbon containing. Things. It's not minerals, it's not NPK, it's not elemental, it's nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, okay, biochemicals. <clears throat> uh, so that's what we're really looking at. Forget humic acid, there's no such thing as humic acid. It's humic acid for that. And, and that is a, such a gigantic broad category, it's like say soup. It could be anything. Okay, but this is what we're looking for. We're looking for the optimum functional group distribution so that we can have all these good amino acids, biochemicals, and all this good stuff that affects gene expression and uh, makes the, the goddess happy. Okay, so uh, I could go into that all day. It's a pretty big subject, but I mean, the point that I'm trying to make is. That this is not that simple, and you have to be selective. You know, uh, we tested eight different human substances, or humates, you know, from the U.S., Canada, Australia, even, and we found scary differences in uh, in, the, in the functional group analysis. And then when we actually did plant bioassays, where we actually grow plants you know, or seed germination tests, and huge differences. I mean, some of them have increased shoot growth, some of them have increased root growth, some of them have negative, some of them have both increased shoot and root growth. Okay, and in, in, in the product we use, one of those. Uh, okay, so, yeah, see, I can go on and on, and, and, and I know it's, it's, we're getting down to the wire here. So, uh, yeah, I could take a few questions right now. Uh, Does anybody have any questions? If uh, anybody's uh, interested in some questions. Come on up to the front and we'll ask them into the computer. I here. guess I can uh, uh, open it up to questions if anybody has any. Okay, can you hear me? Is yes, I can hear you. Any questions? No, sure. I'm yeah. asking about his nutrient pack. Yeah, do you want to give a, just a, maybe a couple minutes on the new packs you're working on? Uh, be more specific. The new, 
you were talking earlier um, this fall about the nutrient uh, packs, the fertilizer packs? Yeah, all right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and that comes out of my research at agroecology and, and the really, really the nutrient requirements, the actual really nutrient requirements uh, for cat hemp slash cannabis, right? Because there is a lot of assumptions made. Remember the day when you used to call to the host, go to a grow shop and couldn't say cannabis or hemp or marijuana, yes, say tomatoes. So a lot of the research was done, you know, growing tomatoes. <laughs> It's a totally different kind of plant, right? So we're talking about what are the specific requirements. So we put together, you know, uh, products, the blended products uh, that uh, that meet the re actual requirements for that, and not just well, let's hope it works because it works with tomatoes. So is that is that what you mean? So so we have, uh, and, and that varies from soil type too. So that can be. Uh, our our blend uh, nutrient packages, which they, they you know include the humic substances, the kelp, things I've been talking about, amino acids, uh, and then other materials that are specific specific soil conditions problems. Like if it's an alkaline soil in Nevada, we'd add sulfur and sulfur uh, activating bacteria so that we can move the pH down and uh, reduce the salt. If it's uh, in acidic soils, like here in the Willamette Valley, you know, we might include a, a calcium source, for instance, uh, so that they're more specific uh, to... Uh, so are you, able to, to, uh, are you able to custom, you know, test and custom blend uh, nutrient packs you know, kind of per situation? Oh, yes, absolutely. We don't use guesswork. You know, uh, we would like to see soil tests, uh, and there's various soil tests you've probably heard about soil uh, <coughs> microbial uh, distribution. Uh, that's that's a good one. That's interesting. You know, and then on top of that, you know, the old Albert method, so we know what saturation, cations, uh, and pH, and those kind of factors we need. You know, to come up with the the ideal uh, uh, combination for whatever ever ever geographic area that we're talking about, soil type stuff like that. So it takes real agronomy and knowledge of soil chemistry, soil ecology to do this. Plus, you know, looking into the actual requirements of the plant. And again, that's where all that work I've done over the years. You know, with uh, giant plants and yielding. Uh, inhibiting things. Now you see the kind of testing we do, this slide here shows we use cucumbers. That's what the Russians use to bioassay human substance. They're, they're real responsive. And so you have to work out like what, how much, you know, it's, it's not guesswork. Um, you have controls on the right, you know, you don't have much root growth there, that's without human substances. And then different concentrations have different effects. So you know, you need this prior information in order to you know really really get down to it. Uh, and we do. And then this is the effect on soil structure uh, because you're still well. What we've seen in, in these kind of tests we do in the greenhouse, uh, where we incubate soil, and I published a paper on this, is we see an increase in fungal dominance. Uh, in the soil, and that seems to translate what the seed do. It does translate into uh, the soil to being a brick on the control to actually having structure and friable. You know, and a lot of that is the fungal uh, activity that granulates, uh, forms crumb structure, so so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, and then you have the uh, the seed germination. That's a little bioassay. So you can tune it in exactly what you need. See, so it's not so much about the product, it's about how, how, how do you use the product. You know? And that's, we provide information, not just products. So is there any other good questions out there? I can't hear anything. Uh, advice on producing a lot of the beneficial human acid on a small scale. So if I'm like, got a window box or something, 
So the question is, um, small scale, how do we create humic acids, you know, on, on our farms? Beneficial. Beneficial. Well, you can go back to the biodynamic literature and use uh, uh, and get the right starting materials and do the right procedures and the blending and the aeration steps and really learn how to make compost, which is science. I think there's a magazine called Compost Science. So most of the people that are really into compost are mushroom growers. Uh, they really don't know how to do it. Um, a lot of stuff that's called compost really is not really there. Uh, biodynamic compost is quite in involved, uh, but the, uh, <clears throat> that's the original uh, method of producing unique substances uh, would be to use cow manure and use biodynamic starter. Uh, it, it, it's a huge subject but in itself. But I mean, if you learn composting and you have a source of livestock waste, see, farming used to be mixed farm, so that's why biodynamic works because you have cows and pigs and you have manure and then you you, you, you grow and you feed like alfalfa and then you grow crops. So you have the, the materials you needed to do the compost, to grow the crops, to generate more manure, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so, you know, if you're a home gardener, well, it, it's you know, you, I guess you can buy cow manure in a bag or something. But, you know, bottom line is you're after humic substances. And our product, full humic, I don't, you know, I don't feel like uh, pitching my product or anything, but it takes 10 to 12 tons of uh, moist compost, you know, ready, ready to use compost, to equal, uh, you know, one to two pounds of uh, a humic, or a humic acid product like ours. So, it, it takes a lot of bulk uh, to produce uh, a little bit of, of real humic acids in you know, all the chemicals I showed you there. So, I'm, uh, not, um, I I'm, not, I'm not sure if we've talked about this in the past, but one of the guys was just asking about, uh, and I don't know if I'll pronounce it right, but Shilaji or Shilaji. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about that when I say that? Well, yeah, sure. Uh, this is a traditional aromatic medicine, and it's uh, extracted from very, very small, very narrow uh, strata under specific types of rainforest in the Himalayas, northern India, where euphorbia is grow. Okay. Now, unfortunately, shilajit or shilajit or whatever is a gigantically broad term, like human gas. Okay, it's a source of humic acid. You, you could call it humic because it's something that contains humic acid. But how much? <laughs> what kind? But who knows? You know, again, it's something they ship out of a hillside and show it, right? And sometimes they adulterate it with urine, with cow urine, because it smells kind of like cow urine. So again, it's a broad category. I don't know. I mean, it's just like somebody calls something humus or humic acid. Well, that's not definitive enough to know anything. But yeah, traditionally, it's defined as a source of humic substance, humic acid. So it's a source of fulvic acid, humic acid. Unfortunately, it's also a source of heavy metals. So you're not sure what you got there. It, it's generally used. Uh, it's not. It's not used in the soil so much. It's used more as medicine or time. It's not really a soil conditioner because it's more expensive. Uh, it really depletes the environment. It's kind of a nasty kind of hand binding operation. It kind of tears up the rainforest. I don't really recommend using it. Only the good things to do. It's not sustainable. It's, it's, it's humic substances are, are, should be derived from uh, recycling organic matter, crop residues, manure, things like that. Or in the case of our products, it's really geologically concentrated organic matter that decomposed over thousands of years. The humates we use it from uh, the Montana area, uh, and they're really ancient deposits of organic matter. They got swept in the low spots after the flood, after flooding, and glaciation, and decomposed and covered with layers. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can make humic substances from any kind of organic matter, mm -hmm. but it's a cost issue. 
it's, it's economic factors. Uh, we know which fungi are, are responsible for producing humic substances. We can do it in a lab. We can do it in a lot of ways. <clears throat> but we used to be able to buy a really nice biodynamic compost when I first started farming. The Zook and Rank company in Gap, Pennsylvania. I'll never forget it because that's what got me started. But they, they produced a, a real authentic a biodynamic compost. And people buy it. And it was shipped all the way to Hawaii. Growers in Hawaii would use it. So it's, I don't know where you can find a biodynamic compost anymore, but you can learn how to make it. And then the other way uh, is, is vermicompost. Uh, using earthworms. And of course, this is what I also did in Hawaii. A lot of people did in Hawaii because it's easy in Hawaii. You can use it year round. You can do it year round. All your waste materials and stuff are added to your worm bed. And so that, that, that's kind of a very effective method of producing a humic substances, earthworms. It's, it's again a little tricky. Um, and then mushroom production is another way. So, uh, from a practical standpoint, uh, a lot of people over the years have tried different things, uh, producing their own compost, uh, using compost tea, and a lot of times it just becomes out of control. I mean, the, the infrastructure required, the labor, the energy, hauling all that stuff, the mixing, the turning, the application. So they come back to using our humic products, humic acids, because like I say, two pounds equals 12 to uh, 15, 20 tons of raw compost. So it just becomes economics, you know. But digging shilajit out of the hillside in India and shipping it here, I'm not, I, you know, it's not, I, don't, I don't really consider that a very good thing to do. Uh, and it may or may not work. So it's an iffy, iffy thing. I don't see it as ecological or sustainable. Um, so that's my, my opinion on that. Yes, right. Bob, can I thank you? Go ahead. It's just, uh, whether it's a shilajit or any other product, it's, uh, it all comes down to the test method and to, to see if the product actually has uh, the human component of it. So as long as you have a okay. standard test method to prove that there is a, uh, the product has the component, that's, that's what I would go with. Oh, yeah. Well, right. Uh, yeah, that's the whole part of the story that you can get to on human gases. We didn't know what it contained. We didn't know how it worked. Uh, we didn't know how to test. Uh, now we have a standard test method, which is accepted worldwide, at least by the scientific community and by the International Standards Organization called ISO. And uh, I have the only label. Uh, there may be another company. I don't know. But in Oregon, Oregon is the only state that allows the new test method. So we can actually claim fulvic acid. So the new test method rules out fraud. It uses a, 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 a resin column and the, the, the specific resin, the CAD, XAD resin. It's like a dialysis resin. So <clears throat> the bioactive fulvic acid sticks to that resin. And everything that's not fulvic acid goes through. So then we, we can uh, remove the, the product of uh, fulvic from that resin and, and you know, dry it away, essentially. And then we, we know what we really have in terms of bioactivity, bioactive components. So there is a test method. And that test method will be used when, uh, when these products are registered under biostimulants uh, because Anything else is like, who knows? I mean, it's a, uh, people use lignosulfonate, which are waste products from paper manufacturing, called fulvic acid. You'll see some of that on the market in a powdered form. But it is, it'll plug up the resin column. <laughs> and here in Oregon, they, they, the test method to get, uh, you know, to go through all this to get it registered, you have to test for sulfur, so they, they know it's not lignosulfonate. You have to test for a bunch of stuff. And it's all about uh, detecting fraud, preventing fraud. And only the fulvic acid fraction, that's what they call hydrophobic, which means it sticks to the resin column, is the bioactive fraction. That doesn't mean the stuff that, that's non 
specifically humic or fulvic, is beneficial. So there's also amino acids in there that are beneficial. But uh, but in order to keep a level playing field, you know, we developed this test method over many years, and now it's accepted by different agencies and experts and stuff. So we have, like, on ours, we have an accredited logo of that test method. And so that, really, I mean, people are always asking me, well, what about this product? What about that product? I don't know. You know, what's, what's, the, uh, what's the analysis show? based on the, on the HPTA method. is the only valid method. Okay, so if you want to compare something, we need to be on the same playing field using the same test method. You know, then you can make a comparison. But bottom line is, uh, fulvic acid is gold and yellow, and humic acid is black or brown. So if somebody says to you, this is fulvic acid, it's brown, that's like trying to sell you an orange that's, that's black or something. It's defined, fulvic means gold in Latin. It means brass colored gold. So it's defined by its color. So if it's not that color, well, you, you got a problem right off the bat. Okay. <clears throat> so does that kind of confuse everybody a little more? Or yeah, not? All right. well, we got to wrap it up here. We're, uh, we're getting tight. But, uh, Josh, okay. Can you, uh, Josh, one more question. Yeah, one more question. What was the name of that fungus that eats the mites? The fungus that eats the mites, can you rename that? Uh, well, there's, it's, yeah, the broad category is it's neozygete, and then there's different versions of neozygete. Can you it for us? Oh, no, come on. <laughs> and, um, Z-Y... Z-I-T-T-S, something like that, neozygete. I'm pretty good at Latin spelling or something. Uh, but uh, neozygete, there's no, there's no common name. So it's only Latin. And then there's Floridana, you know, which means Florida, Floridana. Okay. And then there's other other uh, species named for it. But the broad genus is, is Neozygetes. It's out there, believe me. It's out there. <laughs> it's in the environment and all the time. You know, uh, I mean, I did work for a biopesticide company where we did field trials on strawberries in California. It was incredibly effective. But nobody ever commercialized it because you can't patent it. See? And it's so effective, you know, and it's so cheap. You know, there's no money in it. So, uh, you know, I, I worked for a fairly big company doing that work. Uh, and it was incredibly effective. But sorry, folks, not available. That's not what they want to sell you. So. Well, thank you, you so look much, Dr. Faust. Sorry, I don't, I don't mean to catch you. We're just um, getting tight on time here. But, um, uh, can you tell us real quick where folks can find you? Uh, well, you can go to our website, bioag.com. Uh, we have a human health website, too. It's Wu Jin San. That's Chinese for full acid. Wu Jin San. W-U-J-I-N. S U N S A N so W U J I N S A N. I mean, uh, in Chinese, it means black gold medicine or golden medicine. It's been used since ancient times as a medicine. So that's Wu Jin San, black gold medicine. Dot U S because we make it here in the U S, not in China. So bioway.com Wu Jin San dot U S. And uh, yeah, I. I, I uh, let me show you something here before I get I'm going to show you. I showed you the giant pumpkins. Okay, well, this is how we do, well, this is wheat and uh, drought. Uh, the tree that doesn't have any wilting because it's, it's resistant to desiccation. Control is already wilted. It doesn't have much of a root system. Uh, ooh, what was that? <laughs> Sound effect. Uh, okay, lots of good stuff here. Okay, I got talking about genetic expression. Well, uh, here, here's the actual pathways. Da -da, 40 years of research. Why do we have this resistance from unique substances? It's called molecular genetics, folks. It's all another science. And these are the pathways. Looks kind of complex, doesn't it? Well, it is. 
Um, and anyway, that's uh, different with and without on bad soil, with and without. It's bird seed. I like to use bird seed for testing because uh, it's mixed and stuff in there. That's our uh, operation in Oregon where I am right now. It's my farm. And you can see nice green patch. Well, that's my farm. I'm over there. It's another guy's land. Uh, <clears throat> doesn't look so good. These are our factories. Used to be aircraft hangers. Yeah, test plots. We do test plots. We just don't talk about it. We, we do it on the farm. Okay. Thank you so, very much, sir. What about the genetic, po genetic potential? I'll leave it with this one. You can ponder this one. This, this is a, a variety called um, quantum. No, I don't know. I forget what it was. And, oh, uh, that may have been uh, quantum Kush. Or it may have been, I forget. But anyway. So most people haven't seen a cannabis leaf that big, but that gives you an idea of what the genetic potential of this plant really is. If you get everything right, you know, and there it is. So. Um, that's where we're going. We've got to feed the world, so we have to understand your limiting factors and, and organics, and, and there we go. It's one of my greenhouses. And there's there my iron bed. So I don't just uh, talk about tomatoes. Okay? I've been uh, involved in production of this plant for uh, quite a few years. Uh, probably a lot longer than most of you have been uh, alive. <clears throat> so there's our lab. So you have to test it to know what you got. And uh, there you go. So there's there's our website. Where you can get more information. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um, we're just going to take a quick 10 minute one, guys. Um, if you don't know um, anything about Suzanne, she's right here and she will wake us up. She's got a lot of good stuff. It's controversial. Um, I've got some controversial stuff, own it. No, I don't. <laughs> no uh, we'll take a quick smoke break, guys, and come back and we're going to be into Suzanne. Bye guys, see you in the next one. Don't forget to share.